four months ago, I built a wildlife pond by hand. And since then, it's gone from a bare pile of dirt to a dense jungle teeming with life. Flowers have finally started to come out and it's been a wild two weeks at the pond. I've been going around just trying to keep up with all the new flowers and all the new plants popping up and after going around it seems like a lot of things that are actually growing are things that I didn't even plant. It just seems like it's a lot of opportunistic plant species that have found the perfect conditions here and have started growing which is fine because a lot of them seem to be native plants which should be here and the local wildlife is obviously benefiting from that. Look at this plant behind me. Jerusalem artichoke, Helianthus tuberosus. Since the growing season started, it's grown about seven or eight feet tall, maybe even nine feet tall. Out of all the plants that have started growing around the pond, there's one that dominates the area, lamb's quarter. It's established itself in the bare ground around the pond and each plant will produce tens of thousands of little seeds, which will be a wonderful attractant for birds later in the season. But earlier in the season, these plants have attracted another visitor, aphids. Aphids are small, sap-sucking insects and are considered to be one of the most hated pests. A few aphids isn't a big deal, but an aphid infestation is enough to destroy entire gardens and crops. I'm not too bothered by having them here, you can't really blame them for trying to survive. And after all, not all these aphids showed up here on their own. Some of them were actually brought here by ants. These ants have been farming the aphids and every colony will have their own group that they take care of. They'll herd the aphids to the best parts of the plant, carry them around in their mouth to bring them to different plants or to bring them back to the nest, and most importantly, protect them from predators. In exchange, the aphids excrete a sugary waste product called honeydew, which the ants will feed on. They use their antennae to stimulate the aphids to produce this sweet substance, giving the ants an endless food supply for the entire season. Now this might seem like a mutually beneficial relationship, and it is, until you look a little closer. The thing about aphids is, when a plant is overcrowded and they want to find another food source, they can develop wings and fly to a different plant. The ants can't really have their food source just flying away, so they've been known to destroy or remove the aphids' wings to stop them from flying, and in some cases, they even secrete a chemical as they walk over the aphids, which slows them down and inhibits wing growth, keeping the aphids from ever leaving. But before we start feeling bad for the aphids, let's look at the alternative. Here's a colony with no ant protectors. Hidden beneath one of the leaves are small yellow eggs, which belong to the biggest aphid predator. This alien looking insect is the larva of a ladybug. And both the larva and the adult are an aphid's worst nightmare. They'll live on the same plant and pick them off one by one, leaving behind little aphid carcasses scattered around the entire plant. Working with the ants doesn't seem so bad after all. What's amazing is all of this action can happen on the stem of one plant, and with hundreds around, there's always something interesting going on at the pond. Luckily for us, the trail camera has been keeping an eye on the pond 24-7. It caught these crows bringing in a dried corn cob into the water. And this raccoon running away with it a few nights later. It's seen many frogs hunting for insects along the bank. Dragonflies laying their eggs in the water. Common bird visitors. And it's also caught two new species that have never showed up at the pond before. The first was this beautiful green heron that only stayed for a short visit. 
In the future, when I put some minnows in the pond, he might become a regular, but for now, he's just checking out the area. The second species was a female wild turkey. She showed up a few days in a row, and I was wondering why she kept getting her water from here when I'd never seen a turkey at the pond in the past. Well, I got my answer when she started nesting only 30 meters away from the pond. Here's the weird thing. There were two nests directly beside each other. I only ever saw one female and some days she'd be sitting on one nest and another day she'd be sitting on the other. I always thought female turkeys were solitary during the nesting season so I wondered if maybe she was a young female with not much nesting experience, but sure enough, one day both nests were hatched and the poults were running around. I've never seen anything like this before so let me know your theories on why she had two nests. After reviewing the rest of the trail camera footage, it was time to address a little problem that I noticed around the pond. So we have a bit of an issue at the pond. Actually, we have two issues. The first one is all this vegetation that I'm really happy how it's growing. It's too much right around the pond. It's slowly creeping up and it's leaving less and less bank for the birds to come in. And birds are super vulnerable when they're bathing and when they're drinking. So they just won't use the pond if there's too much tall vegetation directly around it. So because of that, I've been keeping the water level really low so that there's more of the bank. But what that's done is that it's heated up the water. The sun is hitting it constantly all day. And since there's less of it, Song Sparrow just took off. Um, since there's less of it, it's been heating up quicker. And with all the birds coming in at that point, like there's been a ton of starlings leaving all their bird droppings and just influx of nutrients. It's a perfect recipe for algae. So we have had a bit of an algae problem for the first time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have to chop back some of this. Since I am coming in here and kind of shaping the new bank, what I can do is put it in areas where ideally I'd want to be filming the birds from. So I won't cut everything, but I will cut certain parts so that the birds are kind of funneled into this area. So pretty much, yeah, this whole back part is going to be shaved off about six feet or so. Just finished up mowing the back. It might not look better from a human's perspective, but from a bird's perspective, this is definitely a lot safer to come down, drink and bathe. I also have the sides the same height that they were before. So everything should really be funneled and pushed to that side of the pond. Next thing I'll do is I'll take this bucket. I'll empty about 50% of this water and then I'll just fill it and top it up with fresh water. It's pretty crazy. The other day, I saw there was some frog spawn right over here and it's only been a couple days and it's already all gone. And this is the third time this season that it's happened. There's just so many invertebrates in here that they eat all the frog eggs and there is none left. And one of the culprits I've been finding all over is actually you can see a casing right here. That's a dragonfly nymph exoskeleton. So it's come out. It's hatched out of the exoskeleton, and they are definitely one of the predators of these eggs. With the water now being more accessible for the birds, I spent a few days hanging around the pond to see what would show up. And pretty quickly, I realized something. At the small pond I built last year, I only focused on providing water for the birds and not much else. But at the new pond, since I focus on the habitat surrounding the water by adding seed-bearing plants, wildflowers, brush piles, dead logs, and nest boxes, the action around the pond is more consistent throughout the day. During the mornings, eastern phoebes perch on the branches that I set up to hunt for insects. They've even been catching diving beetles from the water, which was pretty impressive. An eastern kingbird pair that are busy tending to their nest also take turns hanging around the pond to catch some insects. An American goldfinch are now the most common species because of all the sunflowers going to seed. In the afternoons and evenings, action from other birds, frogs, and insects is what keeps the pond alive and flourishing.
wanted to check out this nest box specifically because a few days ago, Eastern Bluebirds fledged from this nest box. And I don't want to name names, I don't want to point fingers, but somebody here sort of didn't realize that birds were using this nest box for about, let's say, a month, month and a half. And when this mystery person did realize, again, not naming names, not pointing fingers, uh, the birds fledged about a day later. So kind of dropped the ball, didn't get the whole nesting process, but uh, I was kind of distracted. Wait, did I say I? No, I meant this mystery person was kind of distracted because there was tree swallows that had their nests destroyed by red squirrels in the last video. Well, anyways, that pair found a new nest box and started a new nest. Unlike their first attempt, the pair has not only successfully shaped their new nest, but the female has also laid five beautiful eggs. She's been incubating now for over two weeks and the first egg is ready to hatch. She helps the hatchlings break out of the egg by removing the shell fragments and also eats them for a much needed calcium boost. From this point on, the chicks grow quickly over the next few weeks. until the first one is strong enough to follow the adults out of the nest. One by one, the chicks fledged the nest box, but the last chick, the smallest of the brood, couldn't follow its siblings out of the nest box. It tried throughout the day to make the jump, but the day turned into night and the chick realized it would be spending the night alone. But the next morning was a new day and the last chick was determined to make it out of the box. A few failed attempts led to one final jump out of the nest box. It landed in the grasses below where it took in the new world around it and soaked in the warmth from the sun for the first time. Survival for this fledgling will be an uphill battle, but maybe with a bit of luck, it'll return next year and build a nest of its own at my little wildlife pond.